I'm talking about using Conky to monitor your home lab. Um, it's an interesting topic. I was thinking about this conference and which of my packages I could give a talk on. And this was something that I had half an idea about. And I thought, well, how hard can that be? And I did it and I decided I'd do some research and present a talk. Uh, it turns out how hard can it be is harder than I expected, but not impossible. And now that I've figured it out, it should be easy for you. Um, but as a result, this talk is a little less polished and probably a little shorter than I was originally planning. Um, so Conky has been around for a fair while. It has some interesting limitations and as someone who likes pushing software a little bit past its limits and exploring limitations and seeing what you can and can't get away with, I've had a lot of fun coming up with this. Um, but we'll get into the talk properly. So, as a starting point, um, I thought I'd start with some inspiration because um, everyone has this thought in their mind of Conky being an old thing of just some text and not looking that good. So I thought the best place to start was to show you that it can look good because if it can look good, you might want to use it. That might be interesting to you. So in doing my research, I found a bunch of different config files and I am when I put my mouse in the right spot and I click through a few. Um, this set is really good. I quite like these ones. Um, then this is another good set. There is this style, but in a large number of different colors. Um, again, I think this one had a bunch of different colors in it and different styles from this repo. Um, if you want to go back 10 years to the sort of retro future sci-fi thing, there's this one and this one. So the point is, Conky can look good. That's not really going to be the point of this talk because I ran out of time to write that talk as well as this. So coming into the basics, Conky, as I said before, is a reasonably basic tool. You could see some pretty things there. Um, basically, there's three ways to render your text or render your output. Um, the first one is using text wildcards. So you simply write some text saying CPU and then you use this magical, then you use the magical variable and things will show up and work. With IMLib2, you can also draw static images and probably the most, well, the one you saw most in those screenshots was probably mostly using Cairo for, and Lua scripts which is what we're going to exploit a bit in today's talk. Um, so some more of the basics. These days, Conky config files are valid Lua code. Um, this means you don't have to parse it, and so that makes life a bit easier. Um, that's right, I was going to show you on. I had a laptop crash slightly before this talk started and so I don't have everything open. Apologies for that. So here is the default Conky configuration. You can see there's a bunch of positioning, um, fonts, the position on the screen, and then here is what will be drawn and at the risk of doing live demos and things going horribly wrong you can see we kind of have conky running here but i should also be able to go and here hiding behind my other conky we now see that config file so you can see it's the very basic it's the very small 
can see I just rebooted my laptop. We can see the CPU frequency. Um, see some graphs. If I do this better. Um, and then we have the highest processors. And this is our very generic Conky starting point. And so again, if we come back to this example, you can see down the bottom here, we have all the various, um, the top four processors by name, PID, CPU, and memory. Um, and we've got some scrolling text. That's pretty fancy. Yeah. So this is your default standard config file as I said, split into two halves. Um, so we've seen some of the variables there. Um, there is a list here. And so while Conky looks reasonably dated, especially in that initial conf configuration, the main reason that people like it and use it is, I think there's 400-ish variables you can pick from. So it's capable of monitoring and showing you a lot of things on your local system. Um, I've also put in here, you can use conditional variables. Um, this is a bit of script I use on my laptop, and it basically tells me if my dock is plugged in, and I have a wired connection as well as my wireless. So that's a useful little one. Um, and beyond variables being used as simple substitutions for things Conky knows about, Conky is also able to execute commands and display the output, which can be useful. It's generally slower, slightly, and uses slightly more resources than if you were to do it um, from within Conky if Conky knows about that variable. But as you can see, the first one here, we can execute a command. In the second one, we can execute a command every n seconds. Um, and finally, some things take a long time and you might want to execute a command every n, se n seconds, but in a separate thread. For example, this snippet here, which I use to get my public IP address, mostly just for fun. And so moving on and understanding the basics, we now start to think about how you could use Conky on a remote system. And so obviously the first big command is Conky's here. It draws graphics. You don't want X11 on all your servers. So to fix that problem on its way into Tumbleweed, again, because I forgot to, I ran out of time and in another repo as well, we have this Conky CLI package, which is designed just to run on the command line. And so there's a couple of parameters here. As you saw before, I specified a config file. You can also specify a text string, or if you only want it to run end times and so, And if we have a look at this one here as an example, you can see here we're now printing out these statistics and it will do that forever. What could also be useful is to only do it once. Which, if I type correctly, will work. And if I get the, if I read my slides correctly as well, that also helps a lot. So there we are, we've run it once. Don't know if anyone, you can probably make the font a fair bit bigger. And so 
This just happens to be Conky running on the desktop that's sitting next to this laptop. So the thought from here goes, well, if we can run a command on a remote machine that we can SSH into and we can get Conky to execute any command, then oh, we've got a couple more examples here, but I kind of covered them. And I'm jumping ahead of myself again. So here is a sample Conky config that I was using in that example. So basically, we're turning off X11, we're sending things to the console, and I've used a blank default text string because I'm going to specify my text from the command line anyway. And so, as I was kind of getting to, given that we can, we know we can run Conky from the command line and that SSH can execute any command um, and also that Conky can execute any command, you would be nice and you would think that we could do something quick, simple and easy like this and we are now monitoring our remote system for whatever we care about. We could be calling Conky here, we could be calling the output of another process. If you have something in Docker or Podman or anything else you wanted to monitor. The big problem we get to here is dollars CPU um, could be executed in one of in in filled in in one of three places. You could think of it as a substitution for the Conky script on your host. You could think of it as a substitution for the Conky script on your client. And you could also think of it as a shell as a shell variable that will be substituted with the SSH-C -C command. And so what this leads to is you thinking this should be simple and easy, when in reality you have to spend three hours guessing whether which quotes need escaping, which dollar signs need escaping, and that's kind of hard and annoying. So instead I ended up moving the actual conky call into a simple script and just executing that script. And so that is your first way of doing remote monitoring with conky. This is simple and it works and that's great and especially if you have SSH keys enabled and it's easy to SSH, this might be the perfect solution for you. But at the same time, this current solution, we are opening and destroying an SSH connection once a second and that's probably not the most efficient way of doing things. So we can also look at some other alternatives. And that led me to WebSockets, which I like because there's a library for just about everything. They're simple to program with. And you can even integrate them into web pages and other tools. So you might just run the Conky command line option on all your lab machines, and you might choose to integrate that into a dashboard page you've already written. Um, so being someone who likes the easiest and simplest solution to any given problem, I found this Go application called WebSocketD. Basically it pipes standard input and standard output into and out of web, a WebSocket you can connect to. And while I could make a solution in any number of languages that does something very similar. This one was here and exists. And so this is going to look pretty boring for now, but we have now started a we have now started a WebSocket server that once a second dish is outputting this string we had before 
to whoever decides to connect to it and listen to it. And so, as I was saying before, JavaScript makes WebSockets easy. You basically just write a fake HTML div tag or ID or something, and then you use this magic fancy to substitute it in every time you get something in through a socket. This is quick and easy. I've done it heaps, but it's not the subject of this talk. And so I haven't put too much more into it. Um, so as I was saying before, pretty much every um, language has a library for WebSockets. And as I was also saying before, Conky can execute Lua scripts. So the next fun, fun experiment I thought of that took a fair bit of time is can we make Conky's Lua scripts not just draw pretty things, but also um, connect to a WebSocket so we don't have to start our SSH connections every second. So this is where I've spent a fair bit of time in my research. This was much harder than it should have been because we have choices for WebSocket clients in Lua. There's either a semi-maintained library with lots of missing dependencies or a library that isn't really well maintained anymore. And neither of these things were packaged for any of our dish trays. So I guess I am part of the packaging team. And so I spent a bit of time, actually a significant amount of time preparing for this talk into, we now have this home project on OBS that backports a bunch of law packages for 15.3 and 15.4, both Slee and Leap, should you want to use the Conky WebSocket library, which I'll also be submitting to Tumbleweed sometime soon. But I have designed this repo properly, so if you add it on Tumbleweed, it'll only add things that aren't in Tumbleweed. If you add it on Leap, you'll get everything. Um, it also has the Conky CLI command line client, which I haven't tested properly yet, but that will all be sitting in this repo until such a time as it makes it into proper distros, which might be 15.5. Um, so we have the Law WebSockets library. Um, it's one of my favorite types of software because it's unmaintained and poorly documented but as someone who maintains a bunch of packages for Slee for serial ports, where the packages haven't changed for 10 years because serial ports haven't changed, if code works and doesn't have issues, even if it's not well maintained, I don't mind that too much. And in this case, it works and it provides a number of options. Um, obviously having some form of event loop is better because we could try synchronous but then we'd be back to destroying and creating socket connections every second. Um, in particular using Copass or which is a coroutine library seemed like a good idea and the main reason for that is unlike most event libraries it doesn't need to run its event loop. Um, it has this copas step function which you can put into some other event loop which is perfect for what we're doing because it means when we call our conky script to re-render once a second we can step and get some updates. And so now we get into how to write code with minimal documentation in a language you don't really understand because one of the downsides of this library, as I said, was it is not really documented, at least the copas part. Some of the other parts are. And so I got to the point where I googled websocket.client.copas because I was running out of ideas of how to make all these things work together. And I found one Stack Overflow post, which doesn't quite work 
but it got close and it got me close enough. So I helpfully added a comment to that post saying how and why it doesn't work and what you can do instead. And so if we have a look, I think I've loaded here. So here is our minimum proof of concept lure code. You can see we're requiring some things and we're taking a lock. And then we write this init function, which in our case is the function that's going to run in the coroutine and exist forever. And so basically what we're doing here is we are connecting to our client or to our server rather. Um, we're doing a bit of error checking. Not well because this was just the test to make sure things work. And then we loop forever and we receive messages. And when we get a new message, we throw away the old message and just keep the last one because in the world of Conky, we only ever want to display the latest information anyway. And so then down here, I thought I'd test the um, kind of event loop idea. And rather than calling Copas loop, which could have just printed out the message forever, um, I created my own event loop, which consists of a while true and a two-second sleep. One of the weirdest things I found about the law language is it doesn't have a built-in sleep function unless you use a socket. And so that seems kind of strange and unusual, but that is why we are creating a socket and we're calling sleep there. And I wanted two seconds between the event loop runs because... Sometimes in Conky, you're only refreshing once or twice a second. And I wanted to make sure that that was actually going to work and that was functioning. And so we have this server here. We've started on port 2103. The same server is running on port 2101. So now I should be able to... Welcome to my temporary directory when I press the wrong key. Um, but I should be able to start this test. And here we go. We are now getting the information from a WebSocket. Sorry, just a second. Sorry about that, but here we go. We're getting our information from our remote con key over our web server and so now the next step was no, I've added this test case to the slides because I didn't know how organized they'd be um, the next step was integrating it with Conky and surprisingly for me this actually just worked and so again if we come and have a look at my massive Conky scripts You can get a similar thing here. Here I've put various machines I have that don't all have servers yet because I didn't get that far. And so again, we've got this similar init, init function. I have a shutdown function. That doesn't work because it needs to be called from a coroutine. But by the time Conky is shutting down, it won't let you run any more coroutines and so then we have this remote init function which just adds a thread for each of these addresses um, and then we come down to probably the core of it which is our conky remote loop and this is setting up a Cairo surface um, we're picking our font and then we're just drawing all the addresses underneath each other. And that sounds cool, but we should actually be able to start that. So you can see it. Give everything a few seconds. 
you can see here is my concrete config in all the picture that's for testing for something I didn't finish yet but if you look here in the remote section in what I'm sure is very tiny text that you may not even be able to read so you might just have to trust me that that string we were looking at before is now coming through in Conky and we are successfully monitoring our remote server which was our aim and goal and it's efficient and now it just needs to look nice eventually my plan is to send through a proper comma separated string of useful stuff and then in Lua split it out and make some pretty graphs or do something but I didn't quite get that far yet which uh, brings it to our last which brings me kind of to my last point which I wanted to spend more time on in this talk but unfortunately my research into the other more important topics took a long time and so what I would highly suggest is you grab a copy of the slides which I will upload somewhere um, and look at those first few examples I posted and pick one of them that looks good and start integrating it yourself one of the downsides of Conky is it requires a little bit of work on your own so instead of teaching you useful things we're going to have a little rant about one of the big issues with Conky which is you might see a nice conf this issue by the way happens probably less with the ones I posted because I checked them but you see this nice looking config somewhere on the internet and you go that looks nice that looks good that looks like it covers all the generic bases and it does so much better than our default OpenSUSE com key config so why can't we just use this for OpenSUSE and then you start digging and you manage to download the sources but you find that the sources have no form of license whatsoever and you start looking a little bit further and you see this nice clock that's actually using a font from General Electric and that is their company corporate font which I think these days you're allowed to use for personal use but we're certainly not allowed to ship it or have it in products and so that creates issues for us by the way finding a good monospace font for a clock is really hard and you want it to be monospaced because you want this to stay in the same spot so that it looks the right next to this bit and so that's kind of hard then you look a bit further and at least the source code for these widgets or for some of these widgets um, is GPL2 which is reasonable enough and the rest is config so that's probably okay but again these icons which the person didn't remember where they got eventually I found them when looking for replacement icons and it turns out that these icons are licensed for personal use but not commercial use which is a common thing with a lot of design I think for me the core things to making a nice looking conky config is getting some good backgrounds and getting some nice fonts and unfortunately while there's some nice open source ones you can find a lot of times people use what they like the look of most and that's often ones without a license we can use which is why despite the fact that I've seen this several years ago it is not the default in OpenSUSE you can see that if we come back and have a look at mine I have started working on placing some of the things I need to find new icons still but I created a new background with the intent that eventually we could get a conky config something like this into OpenSUSE distros as a default um, yeah so now we have seen this setup that I've got here I thought I'd quickly walk people through it so it might give you an idea of a way you could do it in reality what you're looking at here is not one conky instance it's many 
for example, Conky sucks at positioning. You can basically position a box. And so the way I have done this one, at least from the text config with Lua, you can do a lot more. Um, so with this one, the background is one instance of Conky. The clock and the date are another couple of instances. This text up here is another instance. And then each of these sort of rectangle sections are all their own instance of Conky. Fortunately, Conky is very lightweight. And so that doesn't cause a massive overhead on a modern desktop system where 30 minutes ago I was talking about creating an SSH connection every second because in reality on modern, syst modern systems you don't really notice that. Um, so we have a bunch of different boxes. And so you can here see we've already looked at the um, remote one. There's code here for the various rings, which is all lower code. At some point, there is other versions of this I've found in those other links that licensed MIT. And I think for, con for stuff that's mostly configuration, I think MIT is a better license. And there's a lot of other conky stuff that's MIT licensed. So when I go through and redo this properly, I'll probably swap out all this code for an MIT version. Um, but as you saw, um, I've chosen to create a startup script because basically for most of those rectangles, we can come and have a look at this global config and the window settings are always the same apart from the positioning. The font settings are the same. Um, the colors I'm using are the same. And so if we come and have a look at the config files for, say, the remote one we were looking at before, you can see I've put these substitutions in here. I've also done width and height so that you can change all the boxes at the same time. And I'm particularly calculating the X values so everything lines up nicely as a pane to do that manually. So I've written some shell scripts to do that. And while we're here, while we're here, you can see I've specified a path to my Lua script, which probably shouldn't be hard coded like that, because that's going to break in something. So that's a note to myself to fix that. And then you can see we've got a startup hook for the init, we've got a shutdown hook that doesn't really work, and we have our loop script that gets called every time we draw which renders whatever the last string was sent through. And so then I have a shell script where I'm getting the screen width because I used different width screens and so I figured that was important. Um, we also, one of the great things if you want to use sed with multi-line config like I have here, year lines become your biggest enemy and so in the end if you substitute all your new lines for ascii bell characters set gets much happier and so we come through and we add those code blocks um i then play around a bit with the y offset for the background and the dates and I then come through and calculate for each of those small blocks the width, the height, and the X off offset, which increments for each one. And then you can see I've got two different backgrounds depending on the size. And we come through and we launch whatever list of configs that we have specified. And so that's how this config works at the moment. About an hour ago, I put it up on this GitHub page, which I'll put in chat afterwards. I'll also put these slides up up there. Um, it is still a mess. Hopefully in the next few days, I'll find some time to sort that out. But that is a walkthrough, my setup. And so some of the things I'm looking at doing as the package maintainer, so we can get to something more like this. 
and less like that other small black box I showed you before. Um, one is better hardware detection. For example, these squiggly lines here, I have one for each CPU up to six or eight or whatever I had on one machine. That doesn't necessarily work properly. This graph of the network statistics, for example, that's hard coded to my ethernet port. And so that doesn't work when I'm running on wireless. I've had to hard code these file system spaces and all that data. And so someone by moving a lot more of this stuff into Lua has come up with better hardware detection and that's something I want to look at as well. I think we're going to end up in an ugly mess where we have a shell script that launches Conkey which is mostly using Lua instead of its own configs. And the second way is I've found all these nice themes I've sh showed you above. Some of them even have proper licenses so we could ship them. And so finding a nice way that when you launch Conky for the first time it tells you you could use this other Conky launcher which will let you pick one of a, one of a number of different themes and use that instead is something I'd like to look at so that when you start Conky you get something nice rather than something ugly out of the box because I think that's what the distro's role is it's to make nice things out of a box especially for distros like OpenSUSE and then I think as I was writing these slides this afternoon I started thinking of things I still had to do that I didn't get done yet and so here's a to-do list um, one is sending an example to that WebSockets library and I have some packages to send through and to finish cleaning up my config files and make some new icons and then eventually make our OpenSUSE and sleep packages better. And so